The college was completely bankrupt in chapter 11 and was going out of business, so it was desperate. And desperate uh, circumstances make for desperate choices. So I think there was probably an inverse um, parallel between who was most qualified and who was youngest. The most qualified person would have been 16, so I was 23. You know, it, it was a situation of complete desperation. It was an anomalous, completely bizarre circumstance. It uh, was an artifact of a strange moment in American history between the baby boom of the 60s, the, the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, the draft, and all the chaos of the late 60s and early 70s. I'm, my career is a function of a random fallout of that period. How to do the right thing when you don't have the resources, and when everybody is only interested in becoming richer. You know, I, I've lived in an institutional culture where we measure quality only by wealth. We think a place is good because it's a big endowment. We don't care what it does or whether it contributes to culture or to education in the nation. We have a terrible elementary and secondary school system. Bard happens to run two public high schools, has the largest prison education program in the country. It runs a middle school and teacher training program in the poorest agricultural district in California. But it's a very poor institution. Where are all the rich institutions? What are they doing about public education? What are they doing in the national interest? What they're interested in is their country clubs. They want to have just a big endowment. So we, as a culture, have permitted them to measure quality by wealth. The larger the endowment, the better the place. The reason people think Harvard and Yale are important places, they're great universities, no doubt about that. But what really sticks in people's mind is that they're rich. When you go to small colleges that don't have university faculty and research programs, you know, they're ranked by third-rate news magazines primarily by their wealth, not by the quality of what they do. So the toughest job is to go against the tide to innovate in education, in the arts, in areas where universities should make a contribution. You know, we have these international programs in Russia. We're now taking responsibility for the American University in Central Asia. We do a lot of things. Uh, prisons is a the thing we're, you know, perhaps to some best known for because it's the largest college degree granting program in the country. Uh, why are we doing that? Well, it's creating a culture and finding people of great quality who are willing to do that, building a college where learning and not fraternities and football and sports and kind of a kind of vulgar social life is the primary aspect of undergraduate life, to focus on undergraduate learning, running a college where the values of education, the love of learning, and public service are a primary aspect of campus culture. That's the hardest thing to do because you're only measured by business standards, not by quality, not what, by what you do, but how wealthy you are. So it's as if a hospital were around the corner and you were a patient. And the hospital said, you know, I'm not going to give you the best training or the best treatment is because I'm waiting for three generations from now when a patient comes in. My attitude is education should be more like a really good hospital. Our primary, obliga our primary obligation is to the patient who comes in now who's sick, who's right before us. Our obligation is to the students we have now, the faculty we have now, to doing the right thing for the country now, not being a bank to protect ourselves so that we still exist for no apparent reason a hundred years from now. Well, American higher education is, by any comparative standard, more democratic than any other system of an industrialized nation. So. Uh, although it isn't as open and available as it should be, and the president is very right to try to press that agenda, it is still far more open and available than in many other countries with which we often compare ourselves. Second, it is a very uneven quality, particularly on the undergraduate level, but also the graduate level. That being said, by international standards, the American university system is still, in my opinion, the very best system in the world and certainly at the highest levels of science and research and scholarship, because the American university is structured to foster innovation and change. Uh, the European system is still very hierarchical 
and very rigid by comparison. So we're a more flexible and responsive system, and we are, I think, at the cutting edge of both scholarship and research. The problem is that uh, American higher education is underfunded, particularly the state universities, and I would have wished that in the stimulus, the president would have done a new land-grant act, would have really put federal money into all of the state universities directly. But the state universities are in a very tough circumstance. Uh, in terms of the ideology, I don't think there's a uniform ideology. There's a tremendous amount of diversity in the university. Now, the universities have always um, had, as all institutions have, a kind of weight in one direction or another. Uh, but it's very slight. What makes a university really important is that it's an aggregate of individuals. Universities never speak with one voice. You know, most people who teach in universities are deviants. I mean, who would be a mathematician? The average person is not a mathematician. The average person is not a physicist. The average person doesn't worry about Chaucer. The average person doesn't, you know, study Chinese literature. I mean, these these are, you know, self-selected nuts by and large. You know, they're not Ozzie and Harriet. They're not your normal neighbor. These are people willing to spend time in archives, studying rare, obscure things, or in laboratories, looking at wacky-looking fluids in computer screens. These aren't what people do to grow up, and, you know, normal people don't do this. And these people are all trained to think for themselves and have their own opinion. Many of them do their own work. Now, in science, they collaborate. But in the humanities, they write their own books, they own their opinions, <clears throat> they quarrel about interpretations and facts and histories. They're eager to make their name for themselves in their fields. So the faculty that make the core of the university are, by definition, self-appointed individuals. Now, they often belong to schools. So in economics, there are a group of people who think sort of alike. And in political science, there are people who think sort of alike. And in literary criticism, there are schools of thought. But these are schools of thought like fishes, with other schools of thought floating around. So in one university, you have usually representatives of all of them. And while they might agree in a faculty meeting on something, it's usually trivial. The most important stuff, they don't agree about. Uh, that's why they teach their own classes, and they have their own graduate students, their own research programs. Now, they may be allied with other people, but often the people they're allied with are not at the same university. They're at other university. They have an international community of scholars. So the great thing about a university is that it doesn't speak with one voice. So all the journalists who talk about the American academic community having a left-wing bias or a right-wing bias don't understand the university. You know, it is that most people are individualists, resist any party membership. They're smarter than everybody who's running for office. Now, when they make a choice, you know, there are two candidates on the ballot. So it's a, when I vote, I always think I'm making a choice of the lesser of two evils. I can think of a better way to do it to begin with. So in point of fact, the university is not a political entity. It's an aggregate of individuals, students who come and go, and faculty who are by definition nonconformists.